The Fermi Paradox, Part 23, Radio Silence, Seclusion or Survival. In the closing years of the last decade, an ideological battle erupted concerning the salvation or destruction of mankind. Should our species take a risk that might elevate us to the next stage of our cultural evolution, but might also condemn us to fiery extinction? Did any one person have the right to take such a risk, acting in the human race's name without consultation, purely on his or her own recognizance? And, most frightening of all, was it already too late? Had we, all unwitting, already taken that risk, and set ourselves down an irreversible path? The reason you've never heard of this conflict is because it took place within the tiny subset of astronomers, futurists, and assorted thinkers that comprise the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, or SETI. For decades, SETI's remit had been to passively scan the skies, listening for any signals that might indicate the presence of an extraterrestrial civilization. But to date, after 50 years of searching, the cumulative result of their efforts have been nothing. The galaxy remains silent. For a certain faction of SETI, this silence was becoming infuriating. All scientific evidence, astronomical, biological, mathematical, had suggested that life, and presumably intelligence, should be everywhere, and yet none had been observed. If they're out there, these dissidents argued, we're not going to find them by listening. We'll have to attract their attention. Thus was born the idea of active SETI, or METI, for Messaging Extraterrestrial Intelligence. In 2006, a meeting of the International Academy of Astronautics drafted a SETI protocol that did not exclude the possibility of sending unsolicited messages into space. Until then, SETI's protocols on communicating with ET had only covered our response to any potential alien messages. Now, the protocol was to be rewritten to accommodate us sending ET a message unprompted and without consultation. The change proved so controversial that two prominent SETI figures, John Billingham and Michael Michaud, resigned from the commission. Broadcasting messages into space is not a new idea. In 1974, Frank Drake, with help from Carl Sagan, used the Arecibo radio telescope to send a basic string of binary data, including a stick figure image of a human, the structure of DNA, a graphic of the solar system indicating where we are, and other potentially useful tools for our enlightened interstellar teachers. It was this message that formed the inspiration for Ben Bartlett's story in the previous episode, though it should be pointed out that the Arecibo message was aimed at Messier 13, a globular cluster 25,000 light-years away, and was never intended as a serious attempt at communication. To date, our race has sent roughly 30 messages to various locations in our stellar neighborhood, including posts on Craigslist, an audio art project constructed from the vaginal contractions of ballerinas, and even a Doritos advertisement. But these were sporadic and uncoordinated. What the proponent camp, which included Seth Shostak and Doug Vokok of the SETI Institute, wanted was a systematic, continuous use of the world's most powerful radio telescopes to send a carefully composed message specifically to alert extraterrestrials of our presence. In 2016, Lone Signal, the first dedicated METI project, beamed a continuous repeating hail into space from a radio telescope in Carmel, California a lighthouse in the cosmic night, screaming, We are here. It is not difficult to envision the potential hazards of such projects. Would we necessarily want to attract the attention of another intelligent species, particularly one that might be similar to ourselves? What if, upon noticing us, they saw us as a threat, or as an inferior race worthy of extermination? We live in a big galaxy, but resources are still finite, and another species, if desperate enough, might... To use H.G. Wells's well-worn phrase, regard our planet with envious eyes. Proponents of METI argue that any civilization advanced enough to read our signals would have moved beyond such petty concerns in the name of long-term survival. But can we really base the future of our race on such a utopian assumption? The omens, extrapolating from our sample of one, are not good. We like to see ourselves as gradually overcoming our base animal natures but it's only been 70-odd years since the shock of the Holocaust gave the Western world a horror of racial warfare. 
Before then, as Stephen Kinsner noted in his editorial on Medi in the Boston Globe, it was not uncommon to hear men of power and prestige speak casually of bombing uncivilized tribes or inferior races in the name of Aryan superiority. And it's not like our world has been free of atrocity since then. Under the rallying cry of, You don't shout in the jungle, a group of 28 dissident SETI practitioners which included not just scientists like famed planet hunter Jeffrey Marcy, but also science writer Paul Davies, entrepreneur Elon Musk, and scientist-slash-sci-fi writer David Brin, argued that we have no way of knowing the intentions of an alien intelligence, and signed a statement urging caution and consultation before any such messaging were attempted. Their side received its most significant boost in media coverage when iconic physicist Stephen Hawking opined in his 2010 documentary series Into the Universe that we would have to think very carefully about what we might say. I think this might be just a little too risky. We only have to look at ourselves to see how intelligent life might develop into something we wouldn't want to meet. He capped it with a line that has now become infamous. So if aliens ever visit us, I think the outcome would be much as when Christopher Columbus first landed in America, which didn't turn out very well for the Native Americans. Conversely, Alexander Zaitsev, chief scientist at the Russian Academy of Sciences Institute for Radio Engineering and Electronics, has argued that not only should we broadcast to the universe, we are morally compelled to do so, for to remain silent is to tell the other sentient races that they are alone. Zaitsev, who coined the term METI, has already launched several attempts at interstellar communication from a transmitter in Crimea, and plans to launch more. He argues that we have just as much chance of contacting a benevolent, quote, Luke Skywalker as a malevolent Darth Vader, and that the chance of gaining Luke's knowledge trumps any risk of Vader's wrath. Risk which, he argues, is mitigated by the vast distances between stars, which make invasion unlikely. Jill Tarter, holder of the Bernard M. Oliver Chair for SETI at the SETI Institute, argued that if aliens were able to visit Earth, that would mean they would have technological capabilities sophisticated enough not to need slaves, food, or other planets. If aliens were to come here, it would be simply to explore. One running theme in the argument is whether or not it may already be too late. We have, after all, been broadcasting to the universe for nearly a century, flooding the nearest 80 light years with reruns of Lucy and dating game shows, not to mention military and astronomical radar transmissions which not only operate at the same power as any potential Medi message, but cover far wider areas of the sky, making them far more obvious beacons. Anyone technologically advanced enough to pose a threat to us, Medi proponents like Shostak argue, is advanced enough to detect our signal, and so already knows we're here. Opponents to Medi argue that regardless, we shouldn't be deliberately increasing our chances of detection, and if ETs already know we're here, then we should leave it to them to contact us. One obvious problem with this debate is that much of it hinges on how we believe extraterrestrials will behave toward us, a question currently beyond the scope of science, and whose attempts to answer it often tell us more about ourselves than anyone out there. When I was a child, the consensus view among scientists and science educators was that any aliens we may encounter would be peaceful and enlightened. The argument was that, with our own species facing the threats of overpopulation, habitat destruction, and above all, imminent annihilation at the fickle whim of megaton strong nuclear arsenals, any species that managed to navigate its way through this existential minefield would have to abandon its childish attachments to war and domination. Carl Sagan, a mentor of Jill Tarter's, who incorporated her under the name Ellie Arroway into his novel Contact, said in 1977 that we will not at any time in the foreseeable future be in the position of the American Indians or the Vietnamese colonial barbarity practiced on us by a technologically more advanced civilization, because of the great spaces between the stars, and what I believe is the neutrality or benignness of any civilization that has survived long enough to make contact with it. With time, however, that perception began to change. The Cold War ended, and with it over, the threat of nuclear destruction, once so omnipresent, receded. The immediate environmental concerns of the time, pollution and species extinction, shifted to more nebulous, distant threats like global warming. And, in spite of this, our species has shown no signs of becoming more enlightened or less aggressive. In light of this, and also newer, more evolutionary ways of thinking, some luminaries in the realm of extraterrestrial intelligence began to wonder if long-term survival was less about being wise than simply being smart. Hollywood may have been right all along. We may actually have something to fear from our alien neighbors. 
Humans are predators. Although we evolved from purely herbivorous ancestors, we've been hunting and eating meat for 2.6 million years, and the increased caloric value of meat over vegetable matter likely led to the increased brain size that made us what we are. Also, preparing meat by using tools put less evolutionary pressure on our jaws, which allowed them to shrink, and thus for our brains to expand. Evolutionary accident gave our vegetarian ancestors predatory traits, such as forward-facing stereoscopic eyes that we exploited to the fullest once we transitioned. We have no other examples of a species with our civilization-building capabilities, either in the biosphere or the fossil record, so extrapolation is tentative at best. That said, given that a species with our traits evolved to dominate its planet once, it seems more likely than not that the same traits would lead another species to do the same. Put simply, you don't get to the top by being a pushover. Natural selection is brutal, and species who wish to survive will exploit whatever resources they can, whether we or anyone else like it or not. In 2005, Cambridge physicist Adrian Kent extended the evolutionary paradigm into interstellar space. In the rather pointedly titled paper, Too Damned Quiet?, he proposed that one possible solution to the Fermi paradox was that interstellar species compete with each other for resources across galactic distances, and that these competitions have led either to the extinction of one of the competitors, or the regression of their technology to such a point where they no longer pose a threat to the dominant species. Interstellar distances being what they are, dominant aggressive species would have no way of knowing if another species has risen to pose a threat unless they somehow made themselves conspicuous. Evolution would therefore select those species who knew how to keep themselves quiet much like it selects species in our world, for camouflage. In a galaxy possibly teeming with hidden predators, it behooves us relative antelopes of the interstellar Serengeti to keep our heads down. Given that, in the absence of facts, opinion is all we have to go on in this debate, I'd like to close this episode by offering my own. When trying to predict the actions and ideals of an extraterrestrial intelligent race, in the end, all the data we can draw on is ourselves and when so constrained, it is tempting, and even laudable, to paint them as the better angels of our hearts. But it is not necessarily wise. We cannot assume that technological progress and moral progress are one and the same. It is true that the rise of technology and civilization has, overall, lessened our violence toward one another, but that is not to say that it has made us better people. It has simply made violence less necessary. Also, while technology has lessened the need for interpersonal violence, it has vastly increased our capacity to inflict death and destruction on those we deem deserving. And while it is true, as Jill Tarter says, that a future civilization may evolve beyond the material need for war, we have never needed a logical or rational reason to find others deserving of destruction. And we shouldn't necessarily assume that aliens would either. And as for us, kept safe and snug by the vast gulf of space, an alien enemy need not invade us to cause havoc merely send us the wrong transmission. If, say, our militaries received assembly instructions for an unstoppable superweapon, only to see it turn on them when they switched it on, that would serve both as a highly cost-effective form of defense and a useful gauge of our collective intelligence. Keep in mind that no one, least of all me, is advocating paranoia. That can potentially lead to an even worse outcome. Nevertheless, I personally agree with the skeptics that consultation and coordination are necessary before we send any such hails into the void. In my opinion, the utopian projections of our future favored by Star Trek are very likely wrong. Our current moral stance as a species is, at best, ambivalent, and perhaps ambivalence is the proper emotion with which to approach the our first potential contact with an extraterrestrial mind. All that said, one fact potentially renders this entire debate moot. As transmitter technology improves, within a few decades, the ability to send a message to the universe will be open not only to governments and institutions, but to individuals. Whatever the outcome of such an action, it may be inevitable, and sooner than we think.